Welcome. Today's lesson is a review of the six trigonometric functions, and the lesson is pretty self-explanatory in that it gives us an opportunity to just take a step back and review some of the concepts that we've been looking at all unit long. So we've been investigating really six trig functions, and I wrote them right here, of course, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, cosecant, and secant. And so just reviewing some ideas, making sure we're getting more and more comfortable with uh, each of the concepts that we've referred to, some of the applications, and uh, some of the graphs as well. So why don't we go ahead and start right away here. I have uh, just an investigation at the top, and it seems like such a simple question, right? Like what do the inputs and outputs represent in the six trigonometric functions? But I, I think we would be hard pressed to come up with a very clear response to this question. So I felt it was necessary to kind of put it on the sheet and I'll write what I have and hopefully that it corresponds with what you were thinking and, and what we've been talking about ever since we started um, our units dealing with trigonometry. All right, so inputs, you know, functions have inputs and outputs. So here's what I wrote for my inputs. I mean, in essence, uh, the inputs are any real number with a little bit of a caveat there, but for right now, put that in place. So just be a little careful, and I wrote this also in parentheses on my paper, except for the values excluded from the domain. So remember, not all of these functions have a domain of all real numbers, so certain values are excluded. So uh, let me just make sure I write this correctly for you, except for values excluded from the domain. Now what that's equivalent to, and that's a semicolon by the way, not a very good one, but that's all right. So what these numbers are equivalent to, and this is sort of the important piece that relates it to our whole idea of trigonometry, they are equivalent to the radian measurement of an angle. And this concept, this radian measurement of an angle, opens up an entire branch of trigonometry called the trigonometry of real numbers. Because remember, a radian measurement of an angle is considered a unitless measurement, equivalent to just a real number. All right, good. So inputs are the radian measurements of an angle. Now the outputs, as we get into this piece, represent the specific ratio for that angle measurement. So let me write this correctly for you. So I would write it as the specific ratio for the input's angle measurement. Okay, so inputs are the angle, outputs are the ratio. Excellent. And one thing I do want you to remember with this, so Again, I'll use parentheses here. So please do remember, every angle, and I wrote this on one of your previous notes worksheets, every angle has six ratios that correspond to it. And that's where we get our six trig functions. So every angle has six ratios that correspond do it. Excellent. So we have a sine ratio, a cosine ratio, a tangent ratio, a cotangent ratio, cosecant ratio, and lastly a secant ratio. All right. Inputs are the angle measurement in radians. The outputs would be the ratio for that angle. Perfect. Now we're going to start to do some other things with this where we kind of flip this when we talk about inverses, but we're not there just yet. Okay, let's move on to our examples of the day. Uh, example one is really just a refresher on using the calculator and having the calculator come up with a sinusoidal regression. So I'll just read the problem and uh, we'll go for it. So Mr. Meyer's monthly gas usage in therms over the course of a year is shown in the table and find a sinusoidal regression for the data. So I actually called Excel Energy and, and got this data. And the idea, of course, is it's going to be cyclical in nature, right? It repeats year after year after year. 
end. There's a maximum and a minimum throughout the cycle um, using more gas in the winter months and certainly a minimum amount during the summer months. So let's look at it graphically and, and see if the calculator can come up with a nice regression for us. So uh, again, this should be a review. Shouldn't be a big deal, so just make sure you have your calculator ready to go. And I'm going to go ahead and hit STAT, of course, and we're going to enter the data in. So go ahead and hit STAT and then ENTER. And it looks like just the 12 months there, so as quickly as you can, let's get that data in. I'll do the same, probably slower than you, but oh well. Getting closer. All right, so I've got my 12 months in, and now let's move over to the list two, and let's go ahead and put in the therm usage for each month. So January looks like towards the peak. February gets a little lower, and again, the warmer it gets, the less gas being used. So please go ahead and type in your data there. Hopefully I've got mine perfectly done. Almost there, 67 for me. And lastly, back up to, oops. all right, looks good. Now I'm going to actually look at this, so I need to turn my plot on. So I'm going to go second y equals, actually, you know what, I could just do the y equals right there and just highlight that. So if your plot one is not on, maybe take a moment and, and put it on so we can actually see this. And so the idea again, is it perfectly sinusoidal? No, nah, probably not. But it does have that feel of being sinusoidal in nature, right? Kind of going down and up like this. And the idea, remember, it repeats year after year after year. So even though it's not perfectly sinusoidal, uh, I'll bet you we get a pretty decent fit, all things considered here. Anyway, so uh, now that I'm going to go ahead and know that I'm putting a sinusoidal regression on it, let's go ahead and hit STAT. Move it over to Calc, please. And as you scroll on down, you'll start to see all the regressions. And you should get to sign reg there. And now remember, everybody, I have a TI-83 that I'm um, working on teaching this lesson. If you have a TI-84, your screen here looks a little different. So what you are going to do at this particular stage, if you really want, you can just go down and calculate it. That would be fine with me. But I do want you to get in the habit, it, it does work out pretty nicely. If you can go down to where it says store regression equation, so it should be like the fourth one down, give or take. And um, when you get there, that's where you're going to do the VARs, and then Y VARs, and then function. And we could throw it anywhere. I'm just going to put it into the Y1. So that's what you're telling the calculator do, to do. Excuse me, on your TI-84, you're saying you're storing the regression equation into the Y1. Uh, again, on the 83, you just have to do it right there. OK, if you have the 84, just go down to Calculate. If you have the 83, just hit Enter. And it's thinking, takes a little more time. But you see we get a nice sinusoidal regression. We've got our A, our B, our C, and our D. And I usually go three decimal places out. It's interesting. On this one, 66.999 and then 5. So I'm going to go ahead and round all that to three decimal places. Again, feel free to do whatever you'd like there. So I've got uh, that. And let's see, 0.391x plus 1.841. And lastly, looks like a midline of 80.489. Excellent. Again, we could use this. We could come up with some data. If I asked you for amplitude and period and phase shift and midline, you could come up with that. Not worried about that right now. I'm going to go ahead and just take graph, though, just to see how nicely this model fits. And again, is it perfectly sinusoidal? No. But you can see the data points are pretty close to our model of best fit here. So it looks pretty good. 
again, there's certainly more we can do. And when you do some of these regressions, obviously that potentially would be a piece to make some predictions for it or come up with some of the characteristics for it. But for right now, I think it's our, um, beneficial for us to move on. So that's what I'm going to do. Let's move to example two now. Again, just kind of matching up some of these equations with some of the characteristics graphically. And I've, so it looks like I did five different ones here, sine, cotangent, secant, cosine, and tangent there, and some of the characteristics of these functions that we've been talking about. Again, relatively arbitrary, but the idea is I should be able to give you any one of the six trig functions, any characteristic, and you can use a graphing calculator to analyze that characteristic properly. So let's uh, start them out here as we've got a set of five to go through. So at this stage, I'm going to go to my y equals, and I'm going to clear that out. And actually, now that I'm not using the plot, I'm going to go ahead and de-highlight that. Feel free to do the same if you'd like. And let's begin the process of typing in some of these functions. So first one, sine of x plus, and then pi divided by 2, and looks like minus 3. And the hope is that the zoom trig window will work. So I'm going to go for zoom, and you see number 7 is our z trig right there. And so it looks pretty good. Awesome. So uh, which characteristic are we referring to? Looks like the range. Remember, range would represent um, all of the y values, all of the outputs in this function. And so it looks like vertically I have a minimum down at negative 4. Does everyone see that? The minimum is at negative 4. It looks like I have a maximum at negative 2. And obviously, being a sinusoidal wave, it is fluctuating between the maximum and minimum forever and ever and ever. And so I'm seeing it going in between a minimum of negative 4 all the way to a maximum of negative 2. And those would be the only values that are part of the range. Okay, so range, just make sure you think vertically. When we hit domain, just make sure you're starting to think horizontally. And we've done that for every um, family of function that we've looked at this year. All right, next piece. Let's go graph this next one. Clear that one out. And to get cotangent going, remember cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, so I'm going to do 1 divided by tangent, and I see 2x plus pi, looking good. Same thing. You could just hit graph, by the way, but uh, the zoom standard. And so period. So how long per cycle here? And uh, let's see. Actually, I'm going to show you this algebraically in just a second, but it looks like we have an asymptote right there on the y-axis. We can kind of start our cycle there. And it looks like we have the graph going down like we would expect for cotangent. And then the next vertical asymptote is there. And I believe that ends the cycle. So it looks like right in here, if you can see it, is one full cycle. And so how far is it from um, the y-axis to this first tick mark? And that's what this is right here. That is the first tick mark. And it looks like pi over 2. So I'm seeing the period as pi over 2 one full cycle uh, in one tick mark on the z trig window. And remember, just on the z trig window, this is pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi out there. And so I'm getting pi over 2. Hopefully you'd agree with that. And by the way, algebraically, we do know that there's a connection between the period and the b value. For tangent and cotangent, you might want to write this off to the side. For tangent and cotangent, the period is equal to pi over b, not 2 pi over b. So in fact, I'm going to do it for all of them just to make sure I'm very clear on this. So for sine and cosine and cosecant and secant, the period, the relationship deals with 2 pi over b. But for tangent and cotangent, which obviously we have here, it's pi over b. So, hey, look, there's your b value of 2, so it's just pi over 2. And there's the period. 
So what we saw graphically makes sense with what we would expect algebraically. All right, so again, feel free. Hopefully I'm clear on this piece. That's the relationship we'd be looking at in each case for those six trig functions. All right, next one. And let's go back to that y equals, clear that out. Looks like a secant function, so 1.5 divided by, and I have cosine, and let's go x minus, oops, I put plus, let's put that, there we go. Looking good, I'm going to hit graph. And so we've talked about this before. Domain would be all real numbers except where we have a, a situation where the function is undefined. How would that manifest itself um, graphically? Certainly with these vertical asymptotes, one after the other after the other. And so what I'm seeing is that we have a vertical asymptote at when x is 0. So that's on the y-axis when x is 0. And then I have another one at pi and another one at 2 pi and another one at 3 pi, et cetera, et cetera. So how do I reference that? Well, I would say x equals everything except, and there are a couple ways you can do this. I'm kind of shortchanging it a little, but that's all right. So I'm going to write this very formally just again so I can be clear on how we would look at this. But I would say where's the first exclusion from the domain that we see? And for me, the first just exclusion that jumps out at me is right here. And that was when x is 0. So I would say, you know what? x can't equal 0. Absolutely the case. The next thing I would ask myself, after I get my, my primary one, the one that just jumps out at me, I would say, well, how long until I see the next exclusion? So I would go and say, oh, it's two tick marks on here. So that would be pi units on this particular coordinate plane, and then I've got another exclusion, and another pi units, and another pi units. So it seems like every pi units before and after this one that I've already found, I'm going to get another one. So we would say something like this, x can't equal 0 plus k pi. Now, because it's 0 right here, you can just say, hey, you know what, x can't equal k pi. Either way works. But I like this. This is very formal. This represents the first one you see. This number next to the k represents how long until you get the next one. Good. All right, let's move on to part D. So part D, there we go. So cosine, and I have x minus, and looks like 3 pi over 2. I think I got that right. And I'm going to hit graph. All right, very nice. So zeros, of course, represent um, the x-intercepts here. So looking for the zeros, and I've got like one here, and 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 then it goes on, obviously, infinitely. So what I would say is like, find your primary one first. You know, where's the first one that you see? And again, the first one that jumps out at me just happens to be at zero again. So I would say, all right, there is a zero when x is zero. That's great. So that's my first one. And then I would ask myself, well, how long until I get the next one? And if I look here, it looks like a, it looks like pi units. So if I go pi units, I've got the next one. If I go another pi, I get the next one, and obviously back and back. So same idea. I put my primary one there, and then how long to repeat it, that's the number that goes with the k. So don't mean to belabor the point, but this is the primary one that you just see. And again, this can be of different values, whatever works for you. But that's the one I saw, and then that's how long it takes to repeat after it. So again, I don't need the zero here, so I could just say x equals k pi if I want. Awesome. Let's go do the last one. So typing in, looks like just tangent 0.5x. 
I'm going to hit graph. Okay, I like it. So vertical asymptotes here. Seeing a couple that jump out at me. You know, there's one right there, and there's one right there. Um, so that's it. So where do I see a vertical asymptote? Well, because it is a vertical line, every vertical line has the equation of x equals. And so for me, the one that just jumps out at me, the primary one, so to speak, would be this one right here. And that is when x is equal to pi. So on this vertical line, we have x values of pi. So the equation is x equals pi. All right, that's great. Well, that's only one of an infinite number of vertical asymptotes on this graph. So how do I algebraically represent the fact that uh, there are an infinite number of vertical asymptotes here? So I would ask myself, how long until I get the next one? Well, if I go to the right, unfortunately, I'm not necessarily seeing where the next one is. So, but if I go back, it would be one, two, three, four tick marks, and then there's another one. And of course, they're going to repeat every four tick marks. So what does that represent on this particular coordinate plane? That would be pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 4 pi over 2. Ah, that would be 2 pi. So in reality, I have my primary one right here. And every 2 pi before and after it, I would get another one. And so that's how you're going to represent these algebraically. Primary one right here, how long it takes to repeat goes next to the k. So I hope that clears anything up, just kind of dealing specifically with k. And as I said, at this stage, I should be able to give you any trigonometric function, and you can come up with the specific um, characteristic of that function. All right, let's get into our next, and I believe last example, just broken up into a few parts here. All right, this is good. So let's see if we can do with example three. It says write a function for each graph. And again, just trying to keep things simple. Each horizontal tick mark represents pi over two. And uh, for part A, write three different functions. All right, very nice. OK, so let's start out with the basics. I'm going to do a little work off to the side, and then we'll kind of write our functions here if need be. So first things first, when I see something like this, what I'm trying to do, if at all possible, is write um, a function without a phase shift, because that's easier to do. I'm just kind of jotting things in as I'm chatting here. And uh, so this just looks to me like a flipped cosine, or called it like a negative cosine situation, because notice the y-intercept is a minimum. So what you might want to write on your paper is just negative cosine. It seems to work nicely there. Excellent. I'm getting a midline of 2, y equals 2. All right, that's all well and good. I'm getting an amplitude of 2. That's also nice. OK, I'm getting a period. And let's see what that period is. Can't really go from here. I like to go off the y-intercept if possible, but I don't think that's going to work. So. I think the only way we can find period is from maximum to maximum. So I hope you would all agree that that's the period from there to there. And that would be counting from here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 tick marks. Each tick mark is pi over 2, so 8 pi over 2, which would be 4 pi. OK. Well, that does tell me you should be ready to write the equation. So I'm going to put a little 1 right here, because we're going to write three different ones. And uh, let's see, uh, it should be, I'm getting negative 2 cosine, right? So amplitude is 2. We're going to do negative in front, though, and match it up with cosine. So negative 2 cosine. Remember, in this case, obviously, period is 4 pi, so the b value would be 2 pi over 4 pi. And so the b value is 1 half. So 1 half x. And looks like midline is positive 2. So there we go. That looks really good. 
I would go ahead and confirm it on the graphing calculator, but I think I'm going to wait. I think I'm going to do like all three at once there. All right, now let's see if we can get a little tricky with this. Let's see if we can do a different function, because remember, sine and cosine are interchangeable. One is just a phase shift or the other. So maybe, just maybe, rather than doing a flipped cosine, and that's great that we did, let's see if we can write a sine function for uh, this particular graph. Now, I look at a sine function, I think right off the bat, that a sine function goes through the midline on the y-axis. So it would look something like this, right? You know, kind of go up and so forth. So the question is, how can I translate this? How can I phase shift this, what would be normal sine, right? Kind of looking like this. How can I phase shift it to match this graph? Well, it looks like I've got the same format right over here. How far would I have to move this to match this? Well, it looks like I would just have to move it pi units. So if I want to use sine, and I'm going to write this off to the side as well, I would say the phase shift would have to be pi. Does that make sense? At least the hope is. So again, normal sine looks like this. If I want to get sine to fit this graph, I'm going to have to take normal sine and phase shift it pi units to the right. All right, that's great. Now, I do have to be a little careful here. I do know phase shift is equal to C over B. Okay, so I know right away the phase shift is pi. The C value is unknown. I already know the B value is one half, right? That doesn't change. And if I just multiply both sides by one half, I get C is equal to pi over 2. So 1 half pi, which is pi over 2. So in reality, if I want to match a sine function with this, I need to phase shift it pi units to the right. What would that mean for the C value in order to make that happen, given that the B value is already 1 half? Okay, well, let's put it all together. So I get 2 sine, 1 half x, of course, and then we figured out our uh, C value would be pi over 2, and again, it's always minus the positive there. Good, so minus C, and then plus 2. Awesome. All right, let's try this, just for kicks. Let's see if we can write a cosine function. And we all know, of course, cosine is the one that has the maximum at the y-intercept. So something like that right up there. Oops, a little too high. Sorry about that. Let's go down one. There's the maximum. Cool. Now, what would I have to do to make cosine fit this graph? I'd have to phase shift it all the way over here. So it looks like I'd have to phase shift it 2 pi units. So for cosine, and running out of a little room here, but that's all right. So for cosine, I'd say that the phase shift is 2 pi. And write that down for me. And so what that means, that phase shift is 2 pi. So we know the phase shift is equal to C over B. So C over 1 half. And if I multiply this side by 1 half and this side by 1 half, I can solve for C, and it looks like C is equal to pi. So hopefully that works, and we'll check this out momentarily, but I'm seeing it as 2 cosine 1 half x, and I needed a C value that would allow us to phase shift it all the way from here to here. And so as a result, it looks like that C value would be pi and then plus 2. Pretty cool. Let's graph. Now, I'll try to type this in pretty quickly, but negative 2 cosine 0.5x, close it, plus 2. And let's do all of them. Why not? 2 sine 0.5x minus 
pi over 2. And lastly, 2 cosine 0.5x minus pi, and also plus 2. Did I neglect a plus 2 on this guy? There we go. Got that. All right, let's see what we came up with. I'm going to hit graph. And does it match? Pretty nicely. There's the first. And you're noticing that the second and the third produce identical graphs. It'll stop there momentarily after it's graphed all of them. There we go. All three equations, same graph. Nice. All right, let's move into um, this next one here. So this is one where, if, if you kind of see it, the y-intercept is not the maximum, it's not the midline, and it's not the minimum. So we need to go ahead and find a, um, a phase shift or a C value that will make this work. And I've done one of these before. I'm just going to do, uh, do it again for you. So I use sine for this. You could do cosine, you could do flip, you could do so many different things. But I just do that. It's just very standard, very formal. And what I'm going to do is just plug in all the little things that I know. So x and y, so the y value is negative 1. I'm looking at an amplitude, so let's get a midline here first, by the way. So it looks like the midline is right here at negative 1. Hope everyone sees that. And so amplitude, 1, 2, 3. So amplitude of 3 looks good. Sine, it looks like the period is from here to here, which looks to be pi. 2 pi over pi looks like a B value of 2 in this case. So again, period is pi, B value is 2. The x coordinate that we're dealing with is pi over 6, comes from right there. C is the unknown, and I think I already said D was um, negative 1. All right, so I'm just going to solve for C. Add the 1, everybody. I get 0 equals 3 sine. Uh, let's put this together. 2 pi over 6, which would be pi over 3, minus C. Divide by 3, still get 0. inverse sine of 0. And I got this one, but I'm going to show you on the calculator. Inverse sine, 0, and I get 0. All right, so I get 0 equals pi over 3 minus C. And what do you say if I add the C on over? I get C equals pi over 3. So I put in X and Y here and here. I put in A, B, and D based on the graph, and I solve for C. And now we're ready. So I have my function as Y equals 3 sine 2X minus pi over 3 minus 1. Awesome. Cool. I would check it on the calculator. I'm comfortable with this answer. If you want to go ahead and confirm it, you are more than welcome to, of course. I just want to honor the time here and get on to the last two of this particular lesson. All right, so let's go ahead and do C and D and wrap this on up. So a couple things we have to decide with this one. This is either secant or cosecant. Let's figure out which one it is. So to determine, especially because I'm not going to throw too many variations at you here, what I've told you to do is connect the use as best as possible, kind of like that. Yeah, it's not very good, is it? And if you connected the use, and yours looks a lot better than I just uh, drew on here, but if you connect them, what you did connect, does it look like sine or cosine? And if you notice, because the y-intercept of my dotted graph is the maximum, that means that the dotted part is cosine, which means this is secant. Okay, so now I know it's secant. I have a midline. It looks like at y equals 2. I'm going to throw that in there. Why not? 
And uh, let's see, period. It looks like the period I go from here to here. So that's one tick mark. So period looks to be pi over 2. That's looking good. And again, we've got a midline. I'm not going to throw like weird amplitude type stuff. That would be more of like a stretch on here, and I'm not going to do that. So um, as a result, I think we can pretty much come up with our model as soon as I find my B value. Remember, B value is 2 pi over the period for secant. And if I do that, little outside over inside, looks like I get 4 pi over pi. And so it looks like the B value is 4. All right, so as a result, I have Y equals secant. Again, I'm not going to throw any weird stuff at you in terms of the amplitude on uh, secant and cosecant, and probably even tangent and cotangent as well. Uh, secant 4x, no phase shift necessary, so close that on off. And how about a plus 2? Again, I will let you graph that just so I can get on to the last one. But if you graph this, should match our graph right here very nicely. All right, last one. This is the one that could be either tangent or cotangent. And remember, tangent is the one that increases throughout each interval. Cotangent is the one that decreases. So that looks good right there. I'm getting a period of pi over 2. Do you see one cycle? Looks like every tick mark here. So period is pi over 2. And just remember to get the B value for tangent or cotangent, it's pi over the period, not 2 pi over the period. Outside over inside, outside is 2 pi, inside is pi, and so the B value is 2. And I do see a midline, by the way, of y equals 0. I do want to be careful about shifting anything, so y equals 0 there. And I think we're ready. I would just go ahead and throw it as y equals cotangent 2x. All right. Went through those last couple a little faster just due to the time, but hopefully, because this is the second time around, things are really starting to click for you. All right, thanks, guys. Please do ask questions if you have them. I'm sure you will do great on this unit. There's some really fascinating stuff in here and some great graphical analysis as well. Thanks.